Right, let's get started. Um, so, exam next Wednesday. Everything we cover today is maybe for the exam. Um, as a caveat, chapter 4 and 5, actually chapter 3, 4, and 5 in your textbook cover a lot of material that I do not go over. Like, for example, air resistance. Um, that stuff is not on the exam. So, if you're not sure if a particular section or topic on an exam in the textbook is on the exam, email me or just check the lecture slides. Nothing new on the exam. It's basically topics covered. No surprises, don't panic and start studying. Okay, um, well, I'm presuming you've already started studying. Right. how to solve problems using Newton's laws. And before we actually get to that, uh, one of the forces we need to discuss is friction. Um, It's not moving. Okay. 
Remember, free body diagram, you put the forces acting on an object in that diagram. Nothing else. No velocities, no accelerations, those are not forces, right? And you do not care about the forces that that object is exerting on something else, right? So as far as that little block is concerned, the forces acting on it are mg, straight down, the normal force upwards, right? And I was pushing it that way with some force Fp. And there was static friction that way. Is everyone following? Right? It didn't move because my push force was equal to the force of static friction, which is in that direction. This is just a vector. Right? Notice it's along the surface, right? Friction acts along the surface. It's tangential to the surface, right? Unlike the normal force, which is by definition perpendicular to the surface. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Now, this push force can change, right? I can determine how much push force I have. Correct? Other thing that static friction depends on.
depends on the nature of the surface of plane contact and the normal force. Okay, and that's the relation for static friction, right? So it says that the force of static friction is less than or equal to mu s times n. That's zero mu is really less than or equal to mu s times n. So the Right. So let's consider. So let's say that I have a block sliding, uh, sitting on a table, and F S max. Now that's the maximum force of static friction. So that is the product of mu s and normal force for this situation. Okay. And that number is two point five newtons. So if I push or well, pull with a force of one newton, will this thing move? No. So what must be the force of static friction? I probably clicked too soon then. Right? In order for this thing not to move, if I'm pulling with the force of one newton, the force of static friction must be one newton. Does this make sense? If the force of static friction was 2.5 newtons, right, then when I pull one newton that way, it will accelerate in the other direction. It makes no sense. Right? It's like saying if I pull this towards me, it's actually going to accelerate that. Right? Which is wrong. Okay. Um, let's up the force. I'm going to pull hard. I pull at two newtons. What happens? Does it move? Good. So the force of static friction must now be two newtons, which is allowed, right? Because we know that in this situation, the max force is 2.5 newtons. Correct? Okay, so now let's say I pull at three moves. What happens? It moves, and how does it move? Does it speed up by moving in that direction? And the reason is that there is a net force acting on this object. Right? Um, so, in this case, if I'm pulling with a force of 3 newtons, right, static friction reaches its max at 2.5 newtons, and I have a half newton force pulling it that way, right, causing some acceleration. So, it will accelerate. Now, once it starts moving, right, the force of friction it's fighting is no longer static friction. Right? There is still friction between two objects sliding with respect to each other, right? 
right? But that friction, when the surface is slight, is kinetic friction. Okay? Um, and kinetic friction is a given value. It's mu k, again, coefficient of kinetic So kinetic friction has a consistent value based on the normal force and the coefficient of friction. So again, the force of friction is the coefficient times the normal force. Okay? Um, so let's say that I pull with a force that's equal to Fk. That should be a subscript K. Um, oops. So if I pull with a force equal to the kinetic friction, once it starts to move, it's already finished moving, yeah. right? Once it starts to move, right, the two forces are equal, right? So it's going to move at a constant velocity, okay? If I pull with a force that's higher than the maximum value of kinetic friction, it is going to move with acceleration. That means it's going to speed up in that direction. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's really a question of static versus kinetic friction, right? Um, you guys have moved into dorms at some point and pushed heavy boxes across floors, correct? What's easier, getting the box to start moving, like to start sliding, or once it's sliding, to keep pushing it? Which is easier? Are they the same? Big heavy box. Yeah. 
max value of that force is greater than the force of kinetic friction for most objects. So essentially harder to get something moving than it is to keep it moving, right? It's a difference of which friction are you fighting. Um, a quick note on direction of kinetic friction. Again, it is tangential. It acts a lot of Right, and the fact that it's harder to uh, get something to start moving is embodied by mu s being greater than mu k for surfaces in contact. Okay, and this is mu. It's a unitless dimensionless number uh, which essentially tells you how sticky two surfaces are with respect to each other. Okay. Um, right, I'm going to open a poll. I think I can. You have a block at rest on a horizontal tabletop that is not touching anything except said tabletop. The force of friction in this situation must have what magnitude? Remember, if you suddenly tap on a friction force to that, right, in, without a in response to anything else, if there's nothing to cancel it out, you're saying it will accelerate in that direction, which makes no sense. Correct? Okay, so let's see where you guys are at. Oh, very good. Um, right, click something. So it's zero. Try this one. Same block. I am now pushing it with the force of two newtons and the block does not move. What must be the force of friction on the block? <laughs> So the answer which all of you got is correct. So click something again. Um, it's B. We're not done. OK. Very good. Well, for a good fraction of you, I like the way that this corrects. Um, the answer is, of course, kinetic friction, right? Which is mu k times n, right? Regardless of what force is pulling it. If it's sliding, it's kinetic friction, which is mu k times n. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, 
click something. Well, presumably the correct thing. Uh, and there we go. Okay, uh, before we get to this, we're going to do an inclined plane. So that is an inclined plane, right? And this is an inclined plane. So this is a block. As I lift up, well, as Razvan lifts up this end, what should happen to the block? So right now, is the block yet? Yeah, is the block yet? Yes or not? Yes. Why is it not? Don't everybody shout in excitement. Okay, uh, let's, I don't know how I did that. Right. So I have a skier moving down a 10 degree slope at a constant speed, right? And I'm asked what I can say about the coefficient of friction mu k. Um, notice I'm not given a lot of information. Literally, I'm just told the angle of the incline. Correct? Given one more important piece of information, which you'll tell me in a minute. So that is my 10 degree incline, and it has a constant speed. And that is my skill. Um, from this point on, all my skiers, cars, trucks, everything is going to look like a car. Normal force in what direction? 
perpendicular to the surface, right? Remember, normal means perpendicular, and it's perpendicular to surface of contact. So that guy is the normal force. Right? What else? Straight down, always, right? Pointing towards the center of the Earth. So gravity or weight acts like that and has a magnitude of mg. Everyone with me so far? Okay. What are the forces? And the direction of that force is in what direction? Uphill, right? Because she's sliding downhill. Does that make sense? If a skier was being pushed uphill, what would be the direction of kinetic friction? Down. Right? It opposes the velocity of the object. Everyone following? So since this person is skiing downhill, friction acts uphill. Right? Which means friction acts along the incline. And I'll call friction Fk to say it's kinetic. Everyone with me so In this situation, what do you know about the net force? He said it's going down. The question said it's going down to the constant velocity. There must be no net force. Constant velocity implies zero acceleration. Right? Zero acceleration implies that. Uh, but before we get to that stage, let's just take a minute and think about what x and y axis actually makes sense for this problem. Right? If I pick an x axis like this and a y axis like this, right? My standard form. Okay? If I do that, my issue is as this skier slides, they're moving in the x axis and the y axis. Correct? Right? Moreover, I have two forces, which, you know, friction and the normal force, which lie along neither axis. Does that make sense? If I pick that as x, y. So for inclined plane problems, an easier coordinate system to pick is along the incline and perpendicular to the incline. Okay? So I'm going to pick an x axis that's along the incline. Right? Friction and normal force lie perfectly along a specific axis. Right? Friction lies along the minus x axis, and the normal force lies along the y axis. Right? Meaning, resolving those forces very easily, they lie totally on the axis. Correct? Right? Which means I still am stuck with mg not lying along either axis. Right? If I pick this is my x, y coordinate. 
This force, mg, doesn't lie on the x or the y, it lies in both. Everyone with me? Right? So in order to split the forces on the x-axis and the y-axis, I need to split mg. Right? I need to find how much of mg lies on the x-axis and how much of mg lies on the y-axis, which I'm guessing some of you figure that's what we're talking about here. Right? We're going to split the vector into its holes along the x-axis and the y-axis. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to draw a slightly bigger diagram. So this is my y-axis, this is my x-axis, right? This is theta. Everyone with me so far? Right? And I'm only going to put mg now. So, this is mg. Right? And I'm looking for the x and y components of mg. Everyone with me? Okay. Now, a little bit of angles, extend this line, extend this line. This is a 90 degree triangle, right? This guy. If this angle is theta, this angle must be 90 minus theta, right? And this complete angle is a 90 degree angle. So if this angle is 90 minus theta, this angle must be theta. Okay, convince yourself geometrically that this is true. Um, and now we know that this is mg, this is the negative y-axis, this is the x-axis, right? Um, and it's making an angle theta with the minus y. Now I'm looking for its x component and its y component, right? To find the x component, drop a perpendicular from the tip of mg to the x-axis, right? So this is the tip of mg. I'm dropping a perpendicular, right? So the line I'm dropping is perpendicular to the x-axis, and this guy is mg's x-component. Does that make sense? Are you making a triangle out of I can make it out of either. Like, it's the same as this side, right? Like, this side must also be mgx. Right? So you can talk about this triangle, because you know theta. Everyone with me so far? This is going to get a little messy, but you'll see it enough. And don't worry, we'll go over the basic points at the end. Um, so there is mgx, and similarly, drop a perpendicular to the y-axis, and there is mgy. Right? So if I redraw that triangle, I have mgy, mg, and mgx. This is theta, this is mg, and this is mgx. Right? Just zooming in on that little triangle. Okay? Now, this is theta, this is mg, mg is the hypotenuse. Correct? So in terms of trig functions, mgy, is it adjacent or um, opposite? It's adjacent, so which function should I use? Cosine. cosine. Um, so mgy comes out to be mg cosine theta. And mgx comes out to be mg sine theta. OK, uh, you will get used to that math. Um, right. The important thing to note here, by the way, before I actually go into a little more detail on this, a little bit of a sines and cosines. What's the maximum value a sine function or a cosine function can take? One. Right? Um, what is sine of zero degrees? Sine zero is zero, and sine of 90 is one. Okay? Cosine zero is one. Right? Cosine 90 is 0. Right? So as, as the angle increases, right, sine functions increase between 0 and 90. Right? And between 0 and 90, as the angle increases, the cosine decreases. Right? It starts from its max at 0 and uh, 
which is 1, and then at 90 degrees, cosine uh, 90 is 0. Okay? So, um, mg cosine theta has its maximum value for what value? Um, right, my next step, going back to my incline, is x-axis forces and y-axis forces. Right, so now we're looking at forces and we're going to put them in the x-axis and the y-axis. Right, I've picked downwards along the incline as my The normal force lies in which axis? The y, plus or minus. Plus, it's pointing in the direction of positive y. And all of it lies in the y axis, right? There is no component of the normal force in that x axis. Correct? So I put normal force, which I've called n, in the y axis. Okay? Now, uh, Fk, the force of kinetic friction, lies in which axis? X-axis, plus or minus? Minus. So I put that sign down, and it's minus the force of kinetic friction. I'm left with one more force, which is mg, which I can't put over the x or y. I have to bring both. Correct? mg lies in both. I put the x component of mg, which from here we know is mg sine theta, right? And it points this way, right? So it's pointing in the positive x direction. Does that make sense? mg sine theta lies along the incline and it's pointing down the incline, right? So it goes in the x-axis as mg sine theta. Right? That is the force in the x. Right? And now, the y-axis is mg cosine theta. Am I missing a minus sign on it? Yes, it's pointing down, right? It's pointing into the incline. Right? And I've taken perpendicular out of the incline as my positive. So this is minus. Everyone with me so far? Right, so these are three forces. Two of them I didn't need to resolve. They lay along my total of x and y axis. One of them I did. And then what I did is I took the x component of that force and put it on the x axis. And I took the y component of the force and put it on the y axis. Everyone will be sure. Okay. No other forces. So I can now apply the two second law individually in each axis. Right? So I can say sum of forces in the x-axis must equal mass times acceleration in the x-axis. Right? Um, and sum of forces in the x-axis is this guy plus this guy. Right? These are the forces in the x, so sum of forces in the x is this plus this, which is mg sine theta minus the force of kinetic friction must equal mass times the acceleration along the x-axis. In this example, what is the acceleration of the Zero, right? Because she's moving down the telephone speed. If the question did not say she's moving down the telephone speed, you cannot assume she's moving down the telephone speed. That means that she can accelerate down the speed. Right? All those blocks were accelerating. Now, to get to constant. 
Um, so because she's moving at constant velocity, AX is zero. Right? So mg sine theta minus the force of kinetic friction must be zero. Everyone with me so far? Okay, let's do the same thing to the y-axis. So sum of forces in the y must equal mass times acceleration in the y. Right? And sum of forces in the y is n minus mg cosine theta, which must equal mass times acceleration in the y. In this case, what is acceleration in the y? Is she even moving? most definitely a zero. Right, so I'm left with two nice equations, and remember the only thing given to me in the question was that theta is the energy. Right, as you move it from the last thing, you're asking is my new Right, uh, the one thing that you have is the energy. Where is the new energy? Not quite n. Which of these involves a mu k? Friction, right? And friction also involves n. Okay, so this equation can be rewritten as mg sine theta minus mu k times the normal force is equal to zero. Does everyone follow that, right? This from here to there is just saying that the force of kinetic friction is mu k times the normal. Now, I can use this second equation here to solve for n. n comes out to be mg cosine theta. Everyone with me? Okay. Um, so substitute in, you get mg sine theta minus mu k mg cosine theta equals zero. Right? Divide throughout by mg, and I'm left with sine theta minus mu k cosine theta <laughs> equals zero. Right? Solve for mu k. Mu k comes out to be sine theta over cosine theta, and sine theta over cosine theta is what? Tan theta. So mu k is tangent of theta, which in this question was tangent of 10 degrees, which is a number that you can find using your calculator. Right? Not given a lot of information, <laughs> One more thing, and that is the expression we found for the normal force. Right? The normal force is mg cosine theta. Right? Which means that as theta increases, cosine theta decreases. The normal force of these is the energy of the Correct? That should be a sense. That should be a sense. Okay. Um, I will see you guys on. Stop studying. Oh, actually.